Got it. There we go. Awesome. So everyone, thank you for joining us tonight for our webinar with Vinnie Colucci. This is Digital Photography Bootcamp Part 2. You don't need to have been here for Part 1 to enjoy Part 2, um, but we hope that you were with us. And uh, by way of introduction, a little bit about our presenter tonight. Vinny is a presenter and award-winning photographer. He's been an active photographer since 1979 and a shooting professional since 1995. He has photographed North Carolina to the West Coast and North to the Canadian Rockies. Along with his wife, Annette, Vinny conducts nature and wildlife photography workshops throughout the year. Vinny is an active outdoorsman and a member of Nikon Professional Services and Wimberley Professional Services and a Singray Filter Ambassador and Technical Advisor. Vinny is represented by Picture Stock. His images have appeared in multiple publications, including Nature Photographer Magazine, Newburn Travel Magazine, Microwave Journal, and various other publications. He has also co-authored and authored multiple books. His speaking engagements have included Popular Photography Magazine, as well as uh, presenting at Recreational Equipment Inc, REI, St. Augustine Photo and Birding Festival, Orlando Wetlands Festival, Crane Festival, and multiple universities around the country. So, and Vinny is a return presenter for us. He's been doing webinars for us for a couple of years now, and we are so glad to have him back. Thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate all your kind words. And um, like Michelle said, this is part two of uh, Digital Bootcamp. And um, I do recommend if you weren't part of part, part one, go on the Singway uh, website, take a look and review part one there. Uh, we will at the end, and Michelle will talk about that at the end, be sending out to everybody participating tonight uh, a copy, a PDF of this slideshow. It is actually going to be complete along with the part one part. So you'll have a complete package of both presentations sent to you. And uh, so we're going to get on with the show just here in a second. I did want to point out in the lower left-hand corner of the screen where it tells how I got this photograph. Um, the Singray three-stop Vinnie Colucci extended grad filter, just a little advertisement for Singray. Is, is a filter that in uh, working with the technical team at Singray, we developed. Uh, so it gives you an extended range over the regular graduated filter. It is now in production and, and available. So you can take a look at the website for that or contact Singray and chat with them about that. If anybody does invest in that filter, uh, you're welcome to email me if you want some instruction over the phone on how to use that filter in the field and some of the advantages of it. Now, we'll get to the program. No more advertising, yay. <laughs> um, we, finished, we finished part one talking about the histogram and I'm not gonna get deeply involved with the histogram, but just as a reminder that the histogram is a way for us to know in the field that we have the correct exposure. And uh, so I do recommend that you go back and review that because that's an important part of of uh, digital photography today. During film days, we really didn't know if we got the exact exposure we wanted until we developed either the negative film or, or the transparency film. So a great advantage of digital to me uh, is the fact that we could spot check our exposures after we take our photograph. Now with some of the new, newer, particularly the mirrorless cameras, we are given uh, in many cases we can monitor in our viewfinder or on the monitor behind the camera, a live histogram. So even before you take the shot, you sort of know that you're within the boundaries of what you're trying to do. Uh, but this part two is actually gonna start with something called the white balance. <coughs> a white balance in our camera, and if we're shooting digital, um, we have all picked and, and used white balance. A lot of us use uh, auto white balance, but what is white balance? White balance is really just another set of filters to balance uh, the color temperature of what you're photographing to get uh, a natural 
looking image when you uh, record it on your digital sensor. In the days of film, we used to still control white balance. We used to do that with external filters. If you needed a little more warmth, we put a warming filter on it. If you were shooting fluorescent, you would put a fluorescent filter on it and so on. So uh, white balance in is sort of like having a complete set of built-in filters. Um, typically, um, the, uh, the pics you have in your digital camera are daylight, which is white light, a flash, if you're gonna use a flash, indoors particularly, it's a white light, but you would set your white balance to flash. If I'm photographing outdoors just using fill flash, I do not set my flash, my white balance to flash. I keep it on either daylight or cloudy or something like that. And we'll talk a little bit about those settings. If I'm shooting indoors and you have those uh, orangey looking light bulbs, incandescent light bulbs, you could set your white balance set to incandescent and it'll help balance it so it looks more like a daylight photograph instead of uh, a heavily uh, casted photograph. And if you're dealing with fluorescence inside of a building and you're photographing inside the build, building, you get that green blue uh, look, you could set your white balance to uh, fluorescent and then that will take care of that strange look you get. Cloudy white balance, um, it leans really good when photographing a blue sky. It brings some warmth to the picture. It takes some of that blue out. And in an extreme, if you were like behind a building or something shooting in the shade, you could go to shady white balance. Now, all these white balances, the right way to do it for me is to, you know, in, in general is to pick the white balance for the light condition you have. In wildlife and nature, I leave my white balance 98% of the time. I leave it on cloudy. Why? Because I like that little extra warmth it brings, especially if I'm forced to shoot towards the middle of the day, not the best light. Um, so yeah, um, I typically leave my white balance on cloudy almost all the time. Now, if I get called and I do shoot a wedding, I don't shoot many weddings anymore. Um, I uh, absolutely take it off of cloudy. I don't want the bride to be upset with a yellow looking dress. Uh, so uh, in there, I pick the white balance necessary for the particular uh, setting them out. So uh, there's all sorts of light that uh, could change your white balance. And a lot of people uh, choose to use auto white balance to uh, let the camera pick what it sees and, and the computer and the camera uh, then tries to balance natural light. I want to, and I'll say this a couple of times through the slides, if you pick auto white balance, and later we're going to talk about you know, some filters and, and how white balance affects different filters. It designs out, if you're using a color filter, like a sunset filter, it designs out some of that color in the filter. It's trying to get it back to what the engineers at Nikon or Canon or Sony or Fuji, what they thought the white balance should be to give you white light. So uh, be careful when using auto white balances. There's a time and place to, to use it, but um, I, pick, I particularly rather pick the white balance that, uh, that I'm using. And here's some examples. If we, if we take a look at these five images, the center one, the white balance is on sunny or daylight. Uh, I typically like to leave my camera outdoors at cloudy. If you look up in the left-hand corner, you can see cloudy. If I wanted some more warmth, I could go right to shady. Uh, the upper right-hand corner, you can see the differences. Obviously, if I was shooting outside and put it on forensic, I'm going to get this funky looking uh, color tone to it or incandescent. And, you know, typically we want to avoid that when we're shooting in outdoor um, situations. You could also do so. I'm just going to mention this as a predominantly a wildlife and nature photographer. You can get uh, calibration targets so you can fine tune white balance. Typically, this is used in a studio, so you could white balance a perfect setup in your studio, or if you know you were going to stay inside staging, uh, maybe shooting a reception in a wedding, um, you, could, you could use a calibration target or an expo dish to memorize in your camera the white balance for that particular light in that particular room. Uh, and outdoors, the light's always changing, so using a calibration disc or, or a calibration target to me is, uh, is not the way to go. Um, but I wanted you all to be aware that you can do that. Uh, the LCD screen um, is useful in judging some white balance, but be careful because when you're outside in bright sunlight or in dark sunlight, your monitor on the back of your camera 
um, sometimes you can't quite see the shifts. So I recommend if you're shooting a, a mirrorless camera where you have uh, an EVF or an electronic viewfinder is to take a look at your photograph in the viewfinder. Just actually pull up your photograph, look in the viewfinder because it's a closed system and it's not being interfered with with external light and uh, you get a better idea of how your white balance shifts are, are doing. Some examples here. Now white balance, you know, remember I said it's a set of filters and I like to leave things on cloudy. And if you look at these two images in Charleston, the bridge in Charleston going over the uh, uh, the inlet. Um, in cloudy, I, it was a rainy overcast day and there's a lot of ambient light coming from, uh, you know, the houses and the buildings across the bridge, bouncing off uh, the low clouds. And you get a pretty good looking scene with cloudy white balance. But take a look to the right. I actually purposely used the wrong white balance, fluorescent, and it really created an interesting photograph. So if you have one of those days you're out and you shoot a sunset that's really not quite right, you can flip to one of these other white balances and just see if you get something a little different that might make your photograph a little more interesting. You know, we learn the rules in photography. And once we learn the rules of photography, then we learn to break them sometimes to be creative. And this is a good example of that. We talked about white balance, auto white balance. Here's a, an image. Um, photographed at, at uh, North Carolina Zoo. Auto white balance on the left and cloudy white balance, a typical uh, where I want to set my white balance for outdoor photography and wildlife uh, on the right. In the zoo, you can't always wait for the best light at the end of the day because um, they want you to leave at closing time. So in auto white balance, we got what the camera said is a normal white balance, but leaving it on cloudy gives me more of an afternoon look. So both images are fine. You have to pick what works best for you, uh, but that's the reason I like to keep my, my uh, camera set to cloudy white balance. We have a question on the last slide. Um, which of the two images of that bridge was like what you saw in the viewfinder? Uh, the one on the left. Well, it was the one on the right. I forced uh, a filter called fluorescent built into my camera to create a color cast just because it was different. We were teaching a workshop and, and um, this was supposed to be a sunset at the bridge. And, and that night it rained and had overcast. I brought everybody out anyway, because uh, that's why we have plastic bags to cover our gear and we kept shooting. And uh, after everybody shot the normal shots of the bridge, I showed them how to do this fluorescent white balance shift to just get something different. You have to realize that there's no post-processing to get that color. That's pretty much out of the camera, other than the normal touch-up post-processing that you do. Uh, that's out of the camera. I didn't have to go in and play around in levels. I didn't have to go into Lightroom and do color shifts. That's out of the camera. And, um, and that's basically because we use the internal filter called white balance and pick one that isn't typically used for the scene. And look here. Um, this was well after we did a morning shoot and we're hanging around and the sun was coming up. So white balance set to daylight on the left. This is in uh, the Grand Tetons. This is the famous Mormon barn with the Tetons in the background. But, you know, as the sun came up and we lost that morning warmth, it's an okay shot. It's a postcard shot. Uh, and then we started playing with white balance because in your camera, they give you a Kelvin scale so you could slide it from all the way left, uh, you know, really cool blue to all the way right, really like shown here, you know, 10 Kelvin, uh, which is really, you know, 10,000 Kelvin um, is a really rich, deep white balance. This is obviously, to me, it's too much. Somewhere around 8K would have been better. What I'm trying to tell you here is look in your camera manual, find out how you could change the Kelvin white balance so you could do some experimenting. Auto white balance, this is, remember I mentioned before, auto white balance, you have to be careful. This image here was at Lake Manoskeet in North Carolina. It was a cloudy overcast day. It was boring, it was calm, and we got great reflections, um, but I added a, a custom sunset graduated filter. In other words, it was red on top, graduated down to clear, and I was able to create this illusion 
of color from the sun uh, to make the photograph. That's all cool. We're really not talking about filters, but if I would have had my white balance set at auto, it would have tried to design out that red filter. It would have tried to make it look um, what the computer and the camera says is normal. So auto white balance is why I stay away from um, using it because it designs, if you use the warming polarizing filter, it will try to design out or take out the warmth. So uh, again, I'd rather pick the white balance I need for that particular setup. Uh, but Singray makes custom filters like this. They have a sunset filter. You could ask them about some of their unique filters for doing things like this. So and when we'll you're put, when you're yeah. addressing the Kelvin, um, the higher number warms the image and the lower number tilts it towards blue? Right, the, the, the lower number is a cooler, and the higher number is a warmer. So if, if we slid it all the way down to like 2000 Kelvin, uh, we'd get this blue cast. Um, and remember, like when we pick things like fluorescent, that's really just a Kelvin pick someplace on that sliding scale. It's just that the camera company has preset some of them to be normal. So you don't have to always record your Kelvin number to re reduplicate things in right. most settings. But you can go experiment with the Kelvin scale and, uh, and be creative with it. I don't know if that answered what they were looking for. We have one more question on white balance. Yep. Um, what white balance would you use when shooting the Milky Way? Ah, I've tried a couple of different ways. What is starlight? Think about it. I know nobody can answer and I can hear them. Starlight is sunlight. So I use sunny white balance. I have tried auto white balance. And uh, one of the difficulties, unless you're out in the Tetons or Glacier with me or in the middle of Wyoming, is light pollution, which produces color and color cast. Um, you'll see some Milky Way stuff in just a little bit when we get to fil regular filters. So I use... Um, I use uh, sunny white, uh, white balance, and I use the Singray um, Astro filter, which takes out additional uh, uh, light pollution. And we'll show some of that as we move into filters in just a little bit, like starting now. One uh, more on white balance, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Uh, do the camera manufacturers list the Kelvin numbers for the various white balance settings? Uh, when you uh, when you go into um, your manual, uh, I know on some of my Nikon manuals they do. Uh, I couldn't tell you about some of the other ones. Uh, I believe I yeah I had tested a whole bunch of Sony gear and a whole bunch of Fuji gear a few years ago uh, just to learn it for teaching purposes. Uh, and both of those companies were great in sending me stuff, even though they knew I was a Nikon shooter, just so I could be better educated to help folks in the field. Um, I think I don't remember looking for it in the Fuji, but I remember seeing it in that particular that particular Sony manual where they uh, had those numbers. Okay, that's it for white balance. <laughs> Me, I don't care what camera you shoot. You come on a workshop with me, I'm going to help you take images. You have to shoot the camera that works best for you. Uh, I've been shooting Nikon since 1995. And what I love about Nikon, I've always loved their glass, but I really love, once I got into digital, that from my original D1X all the way through to my Z62, um, that the menus were very similar. Uh, and, uh, and I didn't have to relearn them. And so I just stayed with it. Plus, I own so much Nikon glass, so I couldn't afford to change if I wanted to. All right, filters. There's a lot of filters out there. Singray makes a whole line of filters. Other companies do also. And filters are used to help control light, help control white balance, um, and try and, and try to minimize how much post-processing you have to do. Now, there's a lot of good software out there that could mimic a lot of filters. You know, and uh, but I choose to try to get it as close to right as possible, whether it's exposure or using the proper filter uh, to get it right in the camera for a couple of reasons. One, I hate a lot of post processing. I have to tell you, my average image when I process is 30 seconds or less, and it's usually less. 
I'm not saying I never did levels, you know, and, and, and layers and all that stuff. And, and I do use some software, you know, like if I have to convert to black and white and stuff like that, I'm not saying I don't do that, but 98% of my images that you see take me less than 30 seconds to process. I have good friends that are experts, real experts in post-processing and software, and they could spend an hour on an image and it looks wonderful. But that's not what I'm about. I'm about getting the image as close to possible in the field. And that's why I still use filters just like I did when I was shooting film. In fact, it really sometimes people get upset at me because I teach bird and flight photography, particularly with now mirrorless cameras. If I shoot eight images of birds going by in a burst, seven out of the eight are in focus and sharp. And uh, my techniques, you know, even with all the new stuff they added to mirrorless cameras and eye detection and animal detect, I shoot virtually the same way I shot in 1995 with my F5 film camera. Um, and that's what I teach. I keep it simple. The physics of photography hasn't changed. Yeah, here's a good example. This was uh, a few years back. This is Yosemite National Park. I was headed up to Glacier Point for sunset, but I was passing by um, you know, that's El Capitan on the left, down in the valley floor, wasn't the best time of day. The little river was, was shaded. Uh, I adjusted everything, I, and I probably had a neutral density filter on it to get that shutter speed down to two seconds, but look how bright it was. I picked a graduated filter, and it was a hard grad because that's what I had at the time with me. And you can see along the top edge where the hard grad sort of stops a little bit. And I actually handheld this filter and, and, and wiggled it as I took the two to two and a half expect, uh, second exposure um, to try to get it to blend in. Now we have soft grads and the new extended soft grad that would help it blend in even better. Uh, but look what the filter did to this. This isn't a bunch of post-processing. This is a filter on the front of the camera and how it came pretty much out of the camera. <coughs> the dark side of the the filter was up top, the bottom side, you know, was clear. I shook it a little bit or wiggled it up and down as I took the exposure just to sort of blend it in so I didn't get a super hard line. Uh, again, because back when I took this, I didn't have a, a soft grab with me. Um, there's the settings for the camera. Here, here's a, a scene in the Smokies. This, this barn isn't there anymore. One of the storms that came through knocked it down. So I photographed this right before the storm. This is a, uh, a case where it was an overcast day, but a bright overcast day and the barn's sort of in the shade. And you could see there was no way to get a balance or two. I, I could have taken two or three exposures, I guess, and glued them together in software. But here's what I did instead. This is with two filters, a two stop and a three stop graduated filter. No really additional post-processing. And here's how it worked. If you look up to top where the violet or purple line is, that's where the dark side of that grout is. And it sort of blended it down into the uh, barn. And to the left, you could see where the dark side of that grout was. And I just sort of blended the two, sort of crisscrossed them together to balance the light of the sunlight out in the field with the shade. So this is a single exposure uh, no major adjustments. Here, here's my typical adjustment. If I get the exposure right in, in Lightroom, I add a little contrast. <laughs> Excuse me, I got allergies. It's not COVID, I promise. Um, I add a little contrast. I add a little sharpening. And that's it. Uh, sorry, that's it. Not a lot of post-processing. Here's a little scene. This was after a sunrise down at the beach would appear, but I wanted to get something for teaching purposes. This is a boring scene. The sun is up, it's bouncing through the pier. Um, how can we make a scene? Um, I guess I could have changed the white balance. Yeah, I didn't think of that to like fluorescent, but instead I used a filter. I used a sunset filter because it was red and a mauve filter, add them together just to add a little color. So you could really have fun using some external filters um, to be creative in the field. Here's the most important filter. When, yep. Sorry. When you're using those graduated filters, do you hand hold them or do you have one of them in a bracket or a holder? I typically, I typically, um, put all my filters, uh, when I do an external filter, 
in a, uh, a Lee filter holder. Uh, I like, I happen to like the Lee filter holder, the old one, the new one, I don't like at all uh, for a couple of reasons that we talked about that. Uh, I did a filter presentation this, this past year. Um, you could go back and see that. Uh, and we talk about a filter holder and when I choose the handhold, for example, <clears throat> here, I couldn't get a crisscross cross with a filter holder easily. So I did handhold these two. When I talked about um, wiggling the filter uh, to blend in a hard grad to make it sort of act like a soft grad, I was hand holding that filter. But when I'm actually doing most of my filter work, it's in a filter holder because a filter holder allows a couple of things that allows you to get a precision set of the filter. It also allows me to <clears throat> not touch the camera if I have to do a slow shutter speed like if I'm photographing, you know, water and, uh, you know, and I'm using slower shutter speeds, it also slows me down compositionally. So in landscape work, it, that slowdown is sort of like the days of using an old view camera. It sort of makes me take a second look and I get a better composition for it. So I do use a filter holder, I'd say, well, 95% yeah, of the time. Uh, now, if something happens really quick and I don't have time to set everything up, absolutely, I pick up and, and use a fil hold the filter. But here's the other reason to use a filter holder if you can. Filters, um, these rectangular filters that we use are a polycarbonate, an, an optically perfect polycarbonate that's still scratched. So when you hold the filter up against your lens element, you could scratch that filter. And filters are not inexpensive. And um, so every time I use a filter holder, it keeps a little tiny gap, it keeps it away from scratching, and I have less chance of my filters getting damaged. So on this shot, yeah. um, it says F28 at F16. Do you mean F28 at 1 16th? My lens was a 24 to 70 F2.8. It's not 28, it's 2.8. And, but I set it at F16. In landscape work, Here's how, here, here's how it really works. Landscapes, I focus about, and we did this in part one. Uh, I focus about a third up the scene in landscape work at F16. I pick a spot about a third up my, my scene, and I focus on that. At F16, one third in front and two thirds behind will be in focus. So I typically don't go past F16 because as we approach F22, we get more depth of field, but the lens will start to actually deteriorate a little bit and you'll actually get a softer image. So F16 is a magic number. So I'll do my landscape work between F16 and, and sometimes I'll go to F11, but right around there for most of it. And again, I focus about a third up in the scene. I take a focus point. And at F16, everything's in focus. But so in this case, this was a 24, a Nikon 24 to 70 F2.8 lens, but I set it at F16 to get the massive depth of field that I needed to keep everything in focus. That answer what that person needed. I believe so. Okay. Polarizing filters. I'm a big believer in polarizing filters, but we do have to be careful with them. You know, on really wide angle lens, like 14 millimeters, if you have a blue sky, you might get this funky blue look to it. Uh, but I use a polarizer mostly for controlling contrast and contrast and foliage, you know, where you get the greens to pop and any reflections off the greens go away. Uh, I actually keep one on every lens. I shoot professionally, so I could do that. I recommend that you at least get a polarizer for your largest lens. Like if you have a 77 millimeter, maybe a step down ring. If you have a 72 millimeter size, um, you know, size lens, so you could step down. But I try to use a polarizer every time. Now, here's what I do do. If it starts to really get too dark, like I'm shooting late in the afternoon, I'm waiting for that bear to come into clear. I'll take the polarizer off and shoot without it because I don't want to lose two stops of light when it's that dark. Uh, and, uh, and I might throw on what's called a Hilux filter that Singray makes, which is a clear filter that pops a little contrast. And you can look that up on their website and 
take a look at the properties of the Hilux, but that's an amazing clear filter. A lot of people use that filter on every lens as their protection filter because I use a polarizer so much, even when shooting wildlife, it brings out the detail in the fur, it brings out whenever I could. You know, sometimes you don't have the chance to polarize, uh, but if I'm waiting in a field for a bear to come in, or if I'm waiting in a direction of a canal, or if I'm sitting in the water waiting for an eye level shot of a gator, I'll polarize the direction I expect my subject to be moving in. And, um, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. It's no worse than not having the polarizer on it. But sometimes I get some amazing shots using the polarizer with wildlife. And, you know, the, the feathers on a bird, you know, uh, it takes out some of the reflections in there so you get more detail out of the feathers. Um, and here's a good example. So on the, um, before you go further, yeah. um, can you talk real quick on the difference between the color combo polarizer and the warming polarizer? Yep. Um, the, I use mostly, and I have used, and I do like the, the warming polarizer, but now that I really set my white balance to cloudy all the time and I can control the warmth there, I typically use an LB neutral polarizer. That's what's on every one of my lenses right now. But the uh, warming polarizer adds a little bit of warmth, just like adding that white balance warmth. And, uh, and that's all I use when I shot film, by the way, uh, because I didn't have the ability to change white balance. The color combo uh, actually alters the contrast in color. And it's an excellent filter if you're working with um, like fall colors. If I was doing a balloon festival. I, I do have media credentials. I do a lot of air show work because uh, for one, I'm a pilot. And, and uh, so I love airplanes and air shows. Uh, so I do a lot of air show work. And uh, if I have a lot of color up there, like, you know, uh, hot air balloons, uh, I'll use a color combo to get those colors to pop. Much like in film days, when I used to shoot with Velvia film, Fuji Velvia really popped compared to Kodak transparency film. So the color combo does that. Now, here's where you got to be careful. And even on a scene like this, the color combo would make those greens really pop. But if you're shooting things like people, the color combo sometimes could, depending on the direction of light, can give you a little bit of a milky look to things like skin tones and stuff. So you got to be careful when you use that one. And, um, but boy, when you have it in the right situation, it's an incredible filter. It's my wife. My wife teaches a lot of workshops with me. It's her favorite polarizer. So that's the difference in those two. Typically, you'll see a mixture of some warming ones in here. But right now, I'm using the LB neutral polarizing filter um, on every one of my lenses, probably 90% of the time, 95% of the time. Um, that being said, one of the nice features of the Singray warming polarizer filter, and the LB on these stands for light bright. Unlike a lot of polarizers I use, like for example, I used to use Nikon polarizer, tremendous polarizer, uh, except that it you lose more stoppage. In other words, uh, I'd lose over two stops of light with the Nikon polarizer versus um, the light bright polarizers where I lose about a stop in three quarters. Not a whole bunch difference, but it's a little brighter, easier to look through, easier for your camera to autofocus on low light. Um, so I do like the light bright series and, and the light bright warming polarizer from Singray um, is even brighter than the light bright neutral. It's just a little bit brighter. But if you look at this scene, this is just some water coming through Smoky Mountains. You see a lot of glare and you see, you can't see a lot of detail. Even, even the leaves are a little bit bright and light. Uh, but once I polarize it a little bit, you can see I got some of the glare off the leaves. I got more detail in, in the water where it's not moving. So a polarizer can really control reflections and glare. It adds detail and contrast. That's why I try to use it whenever I can. Look here, this is Grand Prismatic in Yellowstone. Um, shooting through all that hot steam coming up there wasn't a bad little scene. No polarizer. Now, I didn't take the polarizer or if I depolarized it to take the shot for teaching purposes, but you get that milky look. Now, watch what happens with the same scene when I polarize. Boop. Now, that's not post processing, that's the filter. Let's go back and look at that again from there to there. Look what the filter does. Look here. 
polarized. The, the sun was coming from about uh, from the left side, or left to right, and it was about almost 90 degrees. That's when a polarizer works really well with the sky, it keeps all the sky um, consistent. But you see, look what it did to the church. Look what it did to the tree detail. And look what it did to the cloud detail. Just polarize it, you know, no major post-processing. <laughs> Here's a scene. A lot of people say, oh, it's getting dark. I'm not going to use a polarizer. The sun was setting to the, to the far right because uh, I was facing south here. This is the very large arrays out in um, uh, uh, just south of uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, so I did use the polarizer just made everything pop a little bit. And I also used a three-stop uh, grad filter, just a regular grad. I didn't have an extended grad at the time because it was really bright up along the top uh, a little bit from the way the sun was bouncing off those the clouds. So yeah, combining some filters creates, um, creates what I want to see. So when I'm out there, I'm not worried about coming home to post-process. I'm trying to duplicate what my eyes see. And our eyes make all those adjustments automatically. So we have to trick the camera into simulating what our eyes see. And filters allow you to do that. Combination of polarizers, grad filters, even if you have to add a color type grad filter. Here, this is a Singray neutral polarizer. Uh, this is rushing water going on the river bridge. Singray three stop regular ND filter, white balance set the cloudy. Uh, I was able to get a two second exposure that, that made the water nice and, and milky. And uh, it turned out to be a really nice shot, a nice even balance. But the filters helped me gain that, but I having to go back and do whole bunches of post processing. Even on a cloudy overcast day, uh, the three stop. Uh, extended grad here, it was really bright. You know, um, the LB neutral polarizer and the three stop grad was all I needed to capture this scene. If I didn't have the three stop grad, for example, uh, the sky would be super bright. If I didn't have the polarizer on there, I'd lose all the detail in the water and probably I, I wouldn't have been slow enough. I couldn't get down slow enough in shutter speed to get the water to, to, to you know, milk out like that or, or to, to give that illusion of motion. So that's what filters do. But there's other filters in the Singray line and, and other lines are, uh, this is the, um, this is the Singray infrared filter. You know, just, it was, uh, it was a day, it was bright, you know, it wasn't the best time of day to photograph this. Um, I use, I use a, uh, an 830 IRA filter and five minute exposure ISO 1000 at F8. That's it. N not a lot of rocket science here. This was the Nikon Z7 with the 24 to 70 F4 set at F8. So I get a little depth of field. I set it at F16, which would have been double the exposure. My I would have had to wait for a 10 minute exposure. You know, um, so F8 was good enough to do this. And I don't need the sharpness in the trees I do if I shot this in white light. Why? Because infrared gives you that little burst, uh, you know, um, it, it, you know, around the, the foliage. So it, it didn't have to appear as sharp as if I shot a normal landscape. So yeah, F8, um, five minute exposure, ISO 1000, Singray uh, infrared filter. Uh, this is the Singray Astro Filter for removing light pollution. Z6, 14 to 30 f4 um, lens, set at ISO 2000, set at f4 because I try to shoot the Milky Way, open up all the way. This was a 20 second exposure, sort of timed it from when the light on the lighthouse was coming around. So as soon as it went off, it, it, it took about 18 seconds for it to go all the way around. And um, that's your Milky Way shots. Another example of, of using filters. Um, this is, uh, you know, the waterfall on the left was a, this was a warming polarizer. Uh, my white balance uh, was probably set to sunny at the time, but warming polarizer, it had warmth. 
three stop neutral density filter to get to waterfall motion. Uh, and on the right, we did a fog filter. Well, what kind of fog filter is that? Well, really simple. I picked up the filter, I, I, I picked up the ND filter and just used my breath and went, <sighs> and it fogged up and I stuck it on there real quick and took the photograph. So, you know, sometimes you gotta think out of the box and do different things. So that's not really a filter at all, all right? That was just my breath early, early in the morning, fogging up the front of my lens. So a couple of, couple of questions came up. Um, and I put some links in the chat for anyone who wants to learn about the different types of polarizers mm -hmm. and the different types of graduated filters. Mm -hmm. um, so someone wanted you to explain the difference between the extended graduated and the regular graduated filter. Okay. Um, the regular graduated filter covers, um, and I forget how many millimeters, uh, a small strip along the top of the rectangular, like a hundred by 150 rectangular filter. Uh, and, and graduates down to a nice soft edge. But the reason I wanted to explore the design of the extended grad with Sing Ray was because it didn't cover enough of sky, particularly when the sky was bigger. So the extended, the, the Vinny Colucci extended grad filter uh, is about 18 millimeters of, if it's a three stop filter of three stops before it starts to blend into the foreground. So it gives you a larger area to move the filter up and down in the holder to get the right transition. And when we get to the end to show that photograph that we started out with, um, that's the extended grad over the scene. It just took care of some bright light popping through the clouds and blended everything together. Uh, so all it does, the extended grad just covers more sky. And then a couple of questions about exposure. How yeah. do you know how long for the exposure? Five minutes versus two or three or six? Okay, on the um, on the um, for the waterfalls where where I'm picking like two second exposures, a lot of that comes from experience. After I experimented after many many years um, of knowing, once I know what you know, for example, a waterfall, I want to shoot that at two seconds because the water is moving. I want to milk it, you know, have it milk out a little bit. Uh, then I set my exposure to match my shutter speed to get the effect I want. Now with the, um, with the um, uh, infrared filter, that's a little different. That took a, a little cooperation of experimentation. And I have found with my cameras and most of my clients' cameras, Good starting point with the 830 filter is to have a five minute exposure at F8 um, with ISO 1600 to 2000. I mean, with ISO 1000, 800 to 1000. And, um, but that's because I went out and practiced and experimented. And I looked at the histogram after a shot. I look at the histogram and wow, this is underexposed by one stop. So that means if I'm shooting at, um, let's say five minutes, if it's underexposed by one stop, then I got to either double the time, 10 minutes, or open up if I'm at uh, F8 and I need to open up, then I have to go to F4. F4 is not quite good enough because I don't get enough of depth of field for a landscape. So then I make the decision to stay at F8 and then I could open up a stop on my ISO. So if I was ISO, 800, I could go to 1600. That would give me one full stop. So those formulas, uh, and some of that we talked about in part one, part one um, and I could do an hour on any one, you know, any one of those filters. Um, that's how I make my decisions. So if I take a shot and I look at the histogram on any shot and it's off by a stop, what do I got to change to get to uh, you know, to get it to open up a stop. So, so it shifts to the right on the histogram, one stop. Well, if I need to keep the aperture, to, you know, the, the right setting, because that's the depth of field I want, and I need to keep the shutter speed the setting, then I change the ISO a stop. I increase the ISO, so I gain more light. And if, I, if I'm overexposed, I go the other way, you know. So you could use any of those three. I really recommend if you haven't seen part one to go back and review part one. And when you get the PDF, go back and look at the slides. And if you have questions, email me. I'll even get on the phone. We can make a phone appointment. I promise I'm not going to send you a bill. I just want you guys to understand how to do this. 
And this is a lot of material to get in in an hour. Right? You know, I'm trying to hit the hour mark for most of us. But I'll stay here to 8.30. I'll, as long as you guys want me here, I'll stay here. Composition. Composition is about making the photograph look right. How does it look to you so you like it? And I always tell people, if you, uh, if you create a photograph and bring it home and show your family, friends, your colleagues, and it makes them want to go and wish they were there, then your photograph did a good job. Um, a lot of people put the main subject like here, the hot air balloon. I was in a hot air balloon with my wife. She got us hot air balloon rides in Sedona for one of our anniversary trips. Um, so we were in a hot air balloon ride shooting this hot air balloon, and we happened to float past the moon. Well, I can't pass that up. Uh, but compositionally, I had to set myself because you have two main, you have two subjects. This is the supporting subject. I don't know if everybody can see my cursor, but my supporting subject this is the main subject. So I didn't want this dead center, nor did I want this dead center. So a simple rule is the rule of thirds, trying to shift your uh, subject someplace off a of center in a one third mark, someplace around the scene uh, to create a balance in your photograph and movement in your photograph. For example, <laughs> this is a friend of mine who I may do this. She's probably not happy that a whole bunch of you are seeing this right now, but uh, rule of thirds, she's right in the middle. Look behind her. This is all dead, dead area. It doesn't help the photograph at all. This is okay, but this is dead. Well, if we shifted her and we shift her the wrong direction, now she's up against the wall. And this is even better. So we don't want that. But if we did something like this, then she's looking into the scene. It almost makes you want to get behind her, look over her shoulder and see what she's looking at. What is she photographing? So that's the point of composition. Like here, this is a shot my wife took in Savannah. Um, it's actually a leading line. We'll talk a little bit about leading lines. But the main subject is the stairway. It's off of center. It makes you feel like you could walk up the stairway and it gives some motion and balance to the photograph. Even though there's some other supporting, you know, uh, subjects back here, they're not taking away from the main subject. We like to shift our subject off center, but we also have to be aware of if it's, you know, a person or an animal, where they're looking. Like here, I'm not dead center. I'm off center, but the, the wolf was looking this direction. Sort of really not the bad. Look at the difference when I could get them looking into the scene. And you do this by um, throwing raw meat out. No, I'm only kidding. Uh, you do this by just waiting for your opportunity. And a lot of wildlife photography is about opportunity and luck. You know, uh, we could also balance scenes. I do a lot of horizontal shooting, but don't forget to shoot vertically. This is the same scene. Look at the two different looks to photograph. Now, they're not quite dead center. We have a supporting subject to tree. The main subject is the blue herring. And they're balancing each other. So neither one is dead center, uh, but they're balancing each other. Give your subjects room to move. Um, and if a bear is coming at you, you move. But it gives your subjects room to move. Like here. Here's, you know, a subject flying into the scene. Here's our subject here, off center, into the scene, but also looking at me. I like how it leads your eye kind of off of the shot, and it makes you wonder what's all over there to the right. Right. You know, where is this, this one going? Where is he looking? Well, he's probably looking at me for lunch. But, uh, you know, where is he going to go? He obviously was looking to go that direction. So that's what we need to do is when we have a subject compositionally, give them some place to move to. See, I use the polarizer on this. Uh, it brought out more detail, you know? So yeah, I use a polarizer quite a bit, but that's, we're looking for that compositionally movement into the scene. Um, backgrounds, backgrounds are very important. Um, when I do micro work, I'll, I'll drag out a bunch of scrap papers and cloths and stuff, because sometimes we get busy backgrounds we have to put away. But in most of the work, we can control that with depth of field. You know, if I shot 
this was a 70 to 200 two eight lens with a two X converter. Um, let me tell you just quick information I'd like to pass along. When you put a two X converter on a two eight lens, you end up with a five six lens. But our soft depth of field is still about two eight. If I put um, if I put a, a one point four converter on an f four lens, I end up with a five six lens. But the depth of field is still about f four. So like here, it really milked out the clouds in the background, gave a nice pastel look while I photographed him coming through. Look here, this is a turkey I'm laying on the ground. I had a 600 millimeter F4. Uh, the background got soft because I shot it at F4, wide open. I photographed on his eye. Uh, the bird I can't photograph on the eye when they're going by at 20 miles an hour. So I photograph in here and um, you know, the eyes in line with his neck. So, you know, pull the eye in. But compositionally, you know, we have the subjects moving into the field and we're using um, a telephoto lens to drop the back out. If I need more detail in the back, like this gator lean here with this boat, um, I might stop down a little bit. F7.1 started, it's still soft, but it, I wanted to show that detail. I didn't want that to just milk out to, nothing or i have it here leading lines leading lines is any way we're following ourselves through a path um a lot of leading lines are out of corner in this case two corners so compositionally leading lines backgrounds all this stuff comes into play of what you're trying to accomplish now here this is a scene so i focused about a third up the scene right there at f16 everything behind everything in front and focus. This was an old film camera. This was a, a Hasselblad X-Pan camera. And um, it, it absolutely uh, shot in a panoramic, but my leading lines, this was an X-Pan too, actually, uh, let us follow the path of where I'm looking. Lens selection. One of the things that I found taking, and typically when we do workshops, depending on where we're going, I'm taking either eight or up to 14. I never take more than 14. Um, this way, my wife and I, you have two people handling 14 people in the field, because when I take you in the field, I don't go shoot for myself. I'm working with everybody. Everybody gets to see me for the week we're out there all the time. Uh, and everybody gets to see my wife the whole week we're out there. We're behind you with your lens. Uh, and here's what I have learned, that we walk onto a scene, and we have most of our gear in a backpack, because we're wildlife and nature photographers, and guess what? We see a scene, and it looks beautiful, we shoot it, and our camera's out, it's on a shoulder strap, or on a tripod, we shoot it with the lens that's on the camera. I want you to recognize that lenses give you, just like a painter, uses different size brushes and to paint to get a different effect with each paint stroke, we need to pick the lens that gives us the right effect um, for uh, the scene we're trying to shoot. Normal lens, that's what we see with our eyes. If I looked at this scene, uh, this is what I would see. I used, uh, it was a 24 to 70, but it was a 55 millimeter lens. 50 millimeters is about um, what a 35 millimeter camera or a full frame digital sensor sees. And there's a little formula here, so you calculate things out if you have a crop sensor and stuff. Uh, but that's a normal lens, a 50 millimeter lens. Wide angle lenses exaggerate. Here's a 20, this is shot at, at 24 millimeters. It covers more of an area, the sunset that I shot. Um, this was a fisheye lens shooting straight up. It gives me a distorted view but uh, it, it encompassed the whole scene. If I was laying on my back, this is what I saw. And I picked the fish eye lens to simulate what I saw. Telephoto lenses bring us in tighter. Uh, you know, dropping the background out, getting close to the subject without getting trampled uh, and, or eaten if it's a bear or a gator. Uh, but it gives us more compression. And it gives us a softer depth of field. And, um, and it's great for close-ups, even for portraits, because there's no distortion in a telephoto lens. Now, this mess is on purpose. What we're gonna show you here, I want you to 
see, this is a fisheye lens in this scene. And as we start to zoom in, is a 17 millimeter lens. There's a little tree back here I want you to sort of concentrate on as each of these elements, here's a 35 millimeter lens, here's our tree. Here is a 50 millimeter lens. If I was standing by that fence and just looked out in the field, this is what my eyes would see. This gives you an idea of what picking the right lens to show what you wanted to do. And you can pretend that that's a bear sitting out there. 100 millimeters, look how much closer. 200 millimeters. 400 millimeters. And then finally, a 600 millimeter lens. So picking the right lens at the moment for the scene to capture what you really see is why we have a selection of lenses. And I look, one of the things I do in workshops, I make everybody open their bag and I look and I see that one lens is well used and they got two or three or maybe four other lenses that look almost brand new because they're too lazy to take them out at the right time. I want you to take them out. Even with the new VR and, uh, and the image stabilizations that we have, I use a tripod as much as I can. I do a lot of birds in flight handheld now with the new VR, but I use a gimbal head when I'm tracking a lot of times with birds in flight, but you know, uh, deer running, elk, moose, I'm on a gimbal head, on a tripod. I use for landscapes, a ball head. These are my favorite ball heads is the Kirk and the really right stuff. Um, but yeah, I stabilize my work. And just as a rule of thumb, we used to do this with film. Uh, if you have a 35 millimeter lens, you need to be at least a 30th of a second. If you have a 400 millimeter lens, you need to be one 500th of a second. Well, what does that mean? Take this 60 millimeter lens, one 60th of a second. That means you take your focal length. If it's 200 millimeters, one over 200. You find what's closer to one over 200. Sometimes you got to go up a little bit, never go down, but try to go up a little bit, one 250th of a second. When I did some stuff in National Geographic and had to submit it, they said, if you were hand holding, you had, and you were off of a tripod, it had to be at least double that. So I use this rule right now with image stabilization. I get sharp images. If I'm shooting a 400 millimeter lens, I'm at least one 400th of a second or one 500th of a second for hand holding. It's the slowest hand holding you could do. Now, all of us are different. Uh, I'm 66 now, I'm not 46. I can't hand hold as well as, as I used to. And um, it's just a fact of life. So again, I try to use a tripod whenever I can. What's in the bag? This is what I'm carrying right now. Gur here bags, these are my favorite. You know, this is too big of a bag right now. It might go to the medium bag, which is what my wife's using. This is the, uh, the uh, Kaboko uh, version two, the newest version. 30 liter bag. I actually used to carry a 600 F4 with a Nikon D5 Pro body on it. This bag here, fully loaded, I could fit in the overhead of the Havilland Dash 8 twin prop airplane or CJ200, and it never has to go in the back. It always fits. If I'm packing light, I use their 18 light. For when I'm doing um, air show work, I don't need as much with me. For air show work, I'll use this bag to. Uh, do some of that commercial work. But this is the stuff I typically carry. It all fits in this bag. Most of it fits in this bag. And if I do switch to the 22L like my wife, this will actually in the mirrorless will all fit in the 22L. Um, I do like that the Gurgia bag, bag opens up in, besides it fitting in every single overhead I've been in, uh, it opens up in a butterfly motion. So just half at a time. So if I'm working out of the trunk of a car, like if I rented a car and it wasn't an SUV, I, it's not opening this big giant flap. It's opening half the bag at a time. And I could do that in a trunk of a car. Or better yet, I'm out in the rain and I still got to pull a piece of gear out. I'm not opening this big giant flap and my bag's not becoming a water collector. I just open up what I need to get to, pull it out quick and close the flap. Uh, so yeah, if you want to look at Gorgia, they're not a sponsor or anything. I just, I love their bag so much that in 2010, one of the major bag companies, I was fully sponsored. I had a, I had a, a budget of five to $6,000 a year of free bags to give away in my workshops. And I could have any bag I desired for free part of the sponsorship. I gave that up and I buy these. That's how much I believe in the Gorgia bag. Just, it's worth looking at. 
So in the end, we want to follow the rules. And uh, oh, by the way, when you're in like the back country of Glacier National Park, Harry Bash, right? Uh, <laughs> You just should do that. Well, we can break the rules. You know, sometimes we say you shouldn't shoot in the center. But if you look at it and it made it look right, then do it. You know, nobody says you have to follow those rules perfectly. And let the adventures begin before the big cat jumps on you. <laughs> so that being said, um, that completes boot camp part two. And again, everybody that gets sent the PDF file will have part one and part two. Um, if you want to watch part one and you didn't last month, you could watch, uh, you know, a copy of that. Uh, please feel free to go on the uh, uh, Singray webinar uh, website and pull it up and take a look. Okay. If there's any other questions, I am here. Yes, I'm yes. only three minutes um, over. I know. You're almost exactly on time. <laughs> so Laszlo posted um, a link to um, the Kelvin scale, and I'm mm. going to post that in the chat window so everybody can get to that. That looks mm. like a good resource. Okay. Um, and then Sam wanted to know, is the Hilux better than a UV filter? Um, yes, and, and not because I'm a uh, Singray ambassador. Uh, years ago, uh, I was just a Singray customer. And uh, I went to Sing Ray and I never used a clear filter on the front of my lens because back in film days, I always had a polarizer on it. And I would just take the polarizer off if the polarizer would hurt me or if it was too dark to use, I would just pull it off to take that shot and then put it back on. Uh, so I, I didn't like using the UV filters uh, that were out there because they didn't really, other than, um, other than taking some ultraviolet out, they didn't do much. And most of them are, most of them, not all of them, uh, are a cheap filter. In fact, it's usually a giveaway filter when you buy a lens from a camera store. They, oh, here, here's a clear filter, protect your lens. That's really great. But it, those inexpensive filters degrade. You, you buy a thousand dollar lens and you put a cheap filter on the front, it makes that thousand dollar lens into a $500 lens. You know, it just degrades it a little bit. But I walked into the Sing Ray office just as a customer. I was in the area um, and looked them up, drove up there, and I met Bob Singh. And, uh, and, he, and he asked that same question. And I said, no, I never use a clear filter. So he handed me one to look at and looked in the office like a clear filter. He goes, go outside and look through the filter. I didn't he, he even have my camera gear out of the, the car. I walked outside, and there was a tree across the street. I held the filter up to the tree across the street and just looked through it with my eye and it popped the greens in the tree. The Hilux adds contrast. And it also filters out UV and, and, and does some of those other properties. With a, it does have a, a tiny bit of warmth to it too. Just and it, I was about to say, and it adds a tiny bit of warmth. So it's a filter that, and, and it's not a cheap filter. You know, it's not made cheaply. It's a highly a high grade optical filter. And now I use it whenever I don't use a polarizer, there's a high lux on there. So with bird photography, what filter would you highly recommend? I use, I leave a polarizer on it. So if I go out and I know I'm shooting in a certain direction, I'll polarize that direction. Uh, if it's late, late in the day and it's getting too dark and I need my shutter speeds up and I don't want to go super high in my ISO, I'll put a Hilux on it. But I leave my polarizer on it and I polarize the direction I intend to shoot. In other words, uh, I might camp out on an area and the birds are moving from left to right or right to left because that's the direction, you know, based on the, you know, the wind, they like to fly into the wind. They might be building nests in the tree. They might be fishing in a pond or, uh, you know, eagles fishing. So I use a polarizer. If I'm not using the polarizer, I'm using the Hilux. Okay, I think that's it for questions. If anyone has any other questions, pop them in there real quick. Um, join us next month for our next webinar. We do these once a month and we have different guest presenters all the time. They're all professional photographers and all of the webinars are free. So we hope that you will join us again next month. 
Um, that looks to be all the questions. So Vinny, thank you so much for your time. Um, we'll get this recording and the slides out to everyone this evening so you can review the information. Um, oh, and we've got a couple more questions. Good. Okay. Um, do you custom white balance before using the Astro filter? I don't custom white balance at all anymore. Okay. I only made that point in, in this boot camp classes because when I used to do studio work and I, and I used to do commercial work and I used to photograph weddings and I had a portrait studio, um, you know, on my property, I used to do that. I custom white balanced my studio. When Nikon sends me, sometimes they, they'll send me to, to a studio, like a wedding photographer studio to help set up this studio and get it balanced. I'll custom balance the white balance with their lens camera combination for the lights they have. But for wildlife and nature, which is what I do now, I, one of the things I learned, that's why I got out of wedding work, is it's safer to photograph grizzly bears, <laughs> wolves, then bridezillas, and then mothers. So <laughs> I got out of that years ago. Um, so no, I don't custom white balance uh, anymore. Uh, I do it if somebody calls me in and wants me to balance their studio. That's it. We had a comment from Sam. He said he would use Expo Disc to custom white balance gym lights for volleyball and basketball. Yeah, people do do that. Um, I, I don't, I don't, and, and I don't shoot a lot of those sports anymore. I used to do a lot of equestrian shows, and um, but they were usually out in the daylight. So you know, whatever works for you. There's nothing wrong with custom white balancing. Um, and his digital DSR about to die in favor of mirrorless. Say that again. Is digital DSR about to die in favor of mirrorless? I could still buy film cameras, you know, off of eBay and I could still buy film. So they said film was going to die by 2006. <laughs> so I doubt it very much. Here's why I went to mirrorless. Um, I went to mirrorless to try something different. And, um, and because people were having, uh, and, you know, and I still had my D5 and my DA50 when I first went to Mirrorless. And then I fell in love with it because the size was smaller and uh, as different lens. And, and it's not so much a weight issue. If you buy a 2.8 lens, like Nikon Z 2.8 lens, it's just as heavy as the F lens. Um, but this, the physical size of the mirrorless body uh, allowed me to pack it into small spaces. And because I'm on an aircraft more, um, I do find there's still some advantages of digital SLRs. I don't own one anymore. I sold everything and I shoot 100% mirrorless now. Uh, but there's some advantages to uh, digital. For example, when I'm reviewing a photograph in the field, we all have these nice monitors on the back, but those monitors lie to you. Uh, you really can't, you have to trust the histogram, not the monitor. We talked about that in part one. But if I look in my electronic viewfinder and call up the image, it's sort of like being in a little tiny light box. I can really see if it really truly is sharp. I can really see if that is the white balance I should have been shooting. And I can really see if it looks right with the exposure that I picked. So I do really like the mirrorless. And I think that's where we're going. Um, you'll probably find that camera manufacturers will produce less SLRs, but who cares? Unless you're planning to live to 200 right now, uh, there'd be plenty of SLRs for you for the rest of your life, if that's what you wanted. Um, but yeah, mirrorless is probably the direction of the industry, uh, but it's going to take a long time before SLRs are gone. And do you focus on the stars before or after putting the astro filter on? Okay, the astro filter, I can focus with the filter on. Um, but it's really tricky to focus uh, with the mirrorless camera because you're looking at an electronic viewfinder and it's noisy because really when it's dark out, the electronic view viewfinder is not as good as an SLR viewfinder. But here's what I do. All of our cameras, um, all lenses in the mirrorless uh, allow you, if you look through the viewfinder and you focus, you turn the focus ring because now you're in manual focus. You can't, you can't auto focus on a star. So you manually focus, you'll see a little bar come up and it'll go from in, 
it'll go from the closest focus all the way up to infinity. Now, if you just turn it to infinity and you go too far, your stars won't be pinpoint. But if you move it slowly, like so really, you see my hand really slowly and watch that bar, just when it kisses infinity, and you stop right there, those stars will be pin, pin sharp. And uh, that's, so that's how I focus the stars without actually looking at them. In a digital SLR, you can actually see the stars and you could focus it. If your eyes are good, you could focus until uh, it's pin sharp, but you could do the same thing. You could look at uh, the range on your lens where it, it has the clo closest mo uh, focusing mark all the way to infinity. Don't overdrive it because autofocus lenses will overdrive infinity either by hand or autofocus until it locks in, just bring it up till it kisses the infinity mark. And then you know those stars will be sharp. Um, and if you're starting out with a polarizer and money is tight, which would you recommend? The LB neutral polarizer, warming polarizer or color combo? Well, if money's tight, I would get the LB neutral polarizer because you could always add warmth by switching to cloudy or shady uh, or you know, in, in your camera to get that warmth back. Um, the neutral, the LB neutral polarizer uh, that uh, that I'm using from uh, Singray, I love the fact it has no color shift. So what you see is what you get, and um, and I really like that about that filter. Uh, not all polarizers do that. Some of them make the greens a little different than what you see. That doesn't mean they look bad when you take a photograph. It just means they're not accurate. Whereas the, uh, the Singray LB polarizer is very accurate in, the, in that color. And what are the steps to determine the proper exposure when you use a polarizer? Um, if you, the camera, ex, you know, exposure meter will, will take care of that right through the polarizer. Because what the polarizer is doing um, it's, it's doing external to the camera. So as far as the camera knows, um, that's the light that you're recording. You know, if, if you put a graduated filter, you could be in matrix or evaluated metering, for example, and you could put a polarizer on the front of your camera and the light that strikes the sensor, the camera thinks that's the light that God gave you out front. If you put a, a graduated filter in the front, it's gonna balance the exposure based on that, if you're any type of evaluator matrix metering. Now you could do things, um, not with the polarizer, but you could do things with a graduated filter like shoot in manual, take a ex exposure of uh, the foreground and then, and then measure the background. Again, this is a filter, a separate filter presentation, measure the sky and say, wow, they're three, three stops apart. We talked about that in the filter webinar I did a few months ago, um, and then, you know, pick a graduated filter that will balance that bright sky with the foreground, and in manual, you don't have to change anything, because it's going to, even if the meter goes crazy, it's going to hold an original, you know, meter reading, um, but I just find that the cameras are so good, you could just shoot through the filter, and the camera thinks that's what's out there. You're, you're, you're actually altering out there, not within the camera when you use an external filter. Okay. All right, so that's it for the, oh, not it for the questions. Um, oh, it, not a question. Just a great big thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. I love Singray filters, Canon D5, MIV, and the Tamron lenses, and I've put the circular warming polarizer on my lens and use them most of the time. It's a great filter. Yeah. That used to be my go-to filter. I, I changed just recently uh, to the LB neutral as my main one. Just, you know what, not because one way is better than the other. It's just the way. It's just, you know, uh, I just tell you everything I do. I'm not trying to create a whole bunch of Vinnie Colucci's out there. I'm trying to give you a starting point that works for me so that you could have your own personal growth of what you want to do. Okay, so that really is it. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. I wanna thank everyone who joined us tonight. Um, we'll send this information out. If you have questions, reach out to Vinny. His contact info is on the slide here. Um, and Vinny, thank you so much for being our presenter again. We love having you. Thank you very much, Michelle. And, and the uh, Sing, uh, Singray staff, thank you for all the support to all the customer base out there. 
Wow. Thanks, guys. Okay. If you want to just stop that recording. I am getting there. <laughs> Yes, I forgot where I got it from.